This is it, boys and girls, the new Wizard Pro with Nietzsche 144A LED from Ormitech. It's the first time I'm so committed to the flashlight review, partly because every day I see it's been recommended on flashlight forums and subreddits, and I promised to myself to keep my mind open as wide as I can so I could finally understand what all the fuss is about. I want to be as objective as possible despite the fact I've received this light from Armitech company for review and didn't pay for it from my own pocket. Let's start with a bit of a history. In July 2017, Zach from ZachReviews.com published his excessive review of the Wizard Pro and mentioned that he swapped the LED and effectively made perhaps the world's first Wizard Pro with the Nietzsche 144A that is indisputably the best headlamp ever. And in case Hermitech made it commercially available, we'll all love you forever. And Hermitech listened. So fast forward to October of 2019, Hermitech announced the limited edition of Wizard Pro with Nietzsche and V4L 144AR meter and started to ship samples for review. There are tons of reviews of various Wizard models on the internet, so I see no reason to do another destruction test or in-depth review. There are plenty of guys who dropped, drowned, frozen it, ran it over with a car, burned and even sawed it in half. I'll leave the links in the description. I rather wanna talk about the new LED, personal experience, real-world scenarios for this light and I have a bone to pick with Armitech company. So let's go! The main difference between this light and any other Wizard Pro is Nietzsche LED, which gives 4500 kelvins neutral high CRI light with near to perfect natural color reproduction. The LED exact model is Nietzsche NV4L144AR SM453. It's easy to decipher this spell using a datasheet. As we can see in the table, it's a 12 volts LED with typical color rendering index of 93 and minimal of 90. SM453 part defines chromaticity coordinates or simply color temperature of 4500 kelvins. It's natural white close to direct sunlight and 3 step deviation of color matching. It means that the tint of each individual emitter will be within the red circle of that specific coordinate. One step difference is not recognizable by the human eye, so three step deviation is pretty good for a mass produced flashlight. Let's look at the beam shot and compare it to some other lights side by side. The camera white balance set to 5000 kelvins. I have set pretty colorful composition so you could see different lights color rendering capabilities. First light in the lineup is a Nightcore HC30 with swapped Nietzsche 219C 4000 Kelvin's high CRI emitter. Next one is BLF FW3A with luminous SST20 4000 Kelvin's high CRI emitter. As you can see, it has more pronounced hotspot and looks more yellow. Next, the MSRD4 with Nietzsche Do19C 5000 Kelvin's high CRI emitter. It has the similar color temperature, but I like the pinkish rosy tint of the Wizard much more. And to compare with, a really awful old Cree XRE emitter in a cheap zoomy light. and another control, incandescent bulb in a video softbox.
Next, the same lights side by side on a white background. I like and always prefer high CRI lights because I like seeing natural realistic colors of illuminated objects. I mean, why would you want some ugly blue light when you can have nice pleasant tint that renders all the colors accurately? There have been powerful LEDs on the market for years, there's no problem to see in the dark any longer. Now close up stills one after another. To sum up, it's one of the best tints I've seen in a while. It's very pleasant for the eyes, with very accurate color rendition, not too cold but not too warm, so it doesn't feel either blue or yellow. It has that desirable by many pinkish rosy hue, it's perfect, what can I say? In fact, the tint is so good I'm willing to abandon some advanced features of open source UIs like Android and live with proprietary UI in my everyday care light. Look what you've done to me, Army Tech. My first conflict with this flashlight is very flooded honeycomb optic. I would prefer at least a bit of hot spot in the middle. It's definitely too floody to use it as a bike light but it combines beautifully as a secondary fill light on the night bike rides. It lights up everything around you with a uniform wall of light. While the handlebars light, more throwy one, creates a tunnel of low hanging, long range visibility, the wizard makes you aware of your surroundings, always follows your head and line of sight. Of course it's prone to blind others because the light is scattered around, so I wouldn't recommend using high modes in city traffic but it will definitely change everything about riding forest trails in low light conditions. I'm a huge proponent of the L-shaped lights. I think it's the best form factor for EDC lights, because there are tons of situations when the traditional straight lights are just useless and the angle lights are vastly superior. Of course, the most obvious one is a headlamp. That's easy, also because of the clip-on mount on the headband of Wizard Pro. You can tell stand it to light up the working area. Straight lights can't be used like that. Also, the magnets make everything better, especially the flashlights. You can clip it to the helmet and use it as a headlamp riding a bike. Impossible with the straight lights. Clip it to your belt or a collar and you'll instantly have a hands-free light. Another point in favor for the angle lights. And you still have the same possibility to ceiling bounce as with the straight lights, but with a twist. You can point it at any part of the half sphere above the light. And it's better for handheld use than the straight lights. As you can see, the tail switch light has to be re-gripped every time or you have to raise your hand all the way up if you point it forward and want to use the button. Side switch is the opposite. You can't push the button in a tactical grip. The wrist position is more comfortable using L-shaped lights. You can point it anywhere without re-gripping. The button is always under your thumb, and you don't have to bend your wrist or regrip the light either you point it down, forward or up or even behind you. The size of the light is what you pay for impact and water resistance, because it feels like it could be much shorter. But the grip actually is quite comfortable. I hold it far enough from the hot head so it doesn't burn my fingers. And the button is always under my thumb. I don't need to regrip the light to push the side button, which would be the case with the top button. The tail cap looked fat and bulky on the renders and pictures, but in person it has rounded corners and feels nice. It's sitting in the center of the palm, which adds up to the feeling of reliable and secure grip. The side button exceeded my expectations, especially after some reports that it was too mushy. 
It's firm enough, doesn't feel mushy and actuates with a confident press from any side or angle. The button itself feels uh, like grippy silicone, which is different from any other surface on the light. Uh, it helps to quickly locate it by the touch. Overall, the light has a lot of tactile component to it. Lots of ways to grip it, and you can point it accurately. Uh, putting the thumb on the back of the head, you instantly feel where you point it. I haven't used to see at the end of Dyson like this. It's very abrasive, so it shouldn't slip out of hands, even though there is no traditional knurling on the light. I don't know, I have to use it for some time to make a judgment. Now I can say that the clip left a lot of marks right away. I thought I would apply some tape so the clip wouldn't scratch the body so much, because I want uh, the clip to be easily adjustable. I know I will move it around constantly. The tape worked, but it's not an optimal solution. The surface always shows some marks and oily residue, so I feel like I always want to wash it with soap. Thankfully it has very good water protection and can be submerged up to 10 meters. Would a traditional glossy and a Dyson with knurling be better? It's hard to say. Armitech and a Dyson is more pleasant and natural to touch, but the downside is that it scratches a lot more. It feels more like a thin paint coating than the anodizin. I'd like to see some heavily used Army Tech lights. If you have one, send me some pics, please. I'm planning to do a follow-up with update about this anodizing. Uh, the flashlight comes with a magnetic charger, so charging is pretty easy. All you need is to connect the charger and turn the tail cap. Although I'd prefer it to charge without unscrewing and the light will remain operational while it's been charged. Charging starts with a current of 840 milliamps and gradually declines till the cutoff current of around 140 milliamps. Charging consumed 3411 milliamp hours in 7 hours 36 minutes, and battery voltage resulted at 4.17 volts. It's not the fastest charging, but on the plus side, it's healthier for the battery to charge it with the lower current and stop before reaching 100% it will be beneficial in the long run. The downside is it takes forever to charge, seems like it never stops charging. I often wake up in the morning and it's still charging. Other problems that I'm having with this charger? First it's too bright, I can tell it's glowing with my eyes closed. So I have to put it under my bed and cover it with something which is not safe. Second, it's glowing green and consuming energy if the light is charged or even it's not connected to the light, so the power bank or a wall charger can go to sleep mode when nothing has been charged. I checked the same thing with the Rofis magnetic charger. The power bank shuts off after a minute with the charger connected. Uh, the battery included is re-wrapped flat top 3000 200 milliamp hours LGMH1, rated for a standard discharge current of 620 milliamps and 10 amps of max discharge current. Manual claims 50 hours of light on main 1 mode, 10 hours on main 2, and 4 hours and 10 minutes on main 3 mode. It will take almost 2 hours to drain a battery on Turbo 1, and Turbo 2 is under an hour if the light is sufficiently cooled. There is a slight rattling of the battery inside, and I'd like to see another spring in the head, which could help because even after lining inside with the vinyl tape, I still feel a bit annoying rattling of the battery. It seems like there is a software issue with the low voltage protection, because the light doesn't turn itself off reaching the lowest operational limit of the battery, but if you turn it off manually, it won't turn back on. It drained my new chocolate LG HG2 to 2.3 volts, and the stock battery was repeatedly drained. I've seen 1.7 volt once, and I thought it was a goner. The button starts blinking orange every 2 seconds when battery is drained below 3.4 volts, and every second after battery dips below 2.9 volts. 
and the light keeps turning on till 2.6 volts. I would say it's time to stop at 3 volts level, because deeper discharge doesn't make sense. 95% of charge is used, and the steep discharge curve past the 3 volts point tells you that you can fall to dangerous levels very quickly. Look, there is practically no area under the curve past 3 volts compared to the charge that already been used. The light has proprietary firmware and user interface, but it's not too bad. Just a couple shortcuts. One click to turn the memorized mode on or off. Double click to main mode, triple to turbo, and Firefly is activated by long press from off or double click cycles between main mode and Firefly mode. I like that you can ramp up to any mode from off. It can do fancy things like battery check or candle mode, but it's easy to learn. It's hard to accidentally activate strobe mode. I've had maybe two accidental activations doing two double clicks one after another. But I definitely don't like memory for strobe modes. Also, it's a little thing, but it doesn't make sense. See how it waits a half a second before turning on? But there is no reason to wait, I already pressed the button. It should turn on the first moonlight mode and then, if I release the button right away, it should go to memorized mode. Or keep ramping up if the button is still pressed. I'll demonstrate on this lumen top. See how it turns on as soon as I press the button. The light has nice thermal regulation. I try to overheat it by constantly reactivating turbo mode. Isolating it with the bubble wrap and heating turbo, it didn't budge. The maximum temperature I've got is 56 Celsius and then it throttles down to stabilize at 48 Celsius to protect the LED as well as your hands. The top main mode stabilized around 40-42 Celsius at room temperature. Uh, Turbo 1 reached 56 Celsius in a couple of minutes and started throttling down and Turbo 2 reached 56 Celsius in less than 30 seconds before the light indicated overheating by 3 fast red blinks and dropped the brightness effectively to the level of the main 3 mode. Riding a bike at 8 degrees Celsius in high humidity was enough to keep it cool and maintain highest turbo mode. Runtime in that mode was under an hour on a fully charged battery, so grab a couple of spare batteries if you plan to run it in turbo mode for a while. Current price on the Armitech website is $90, which is 10 more than non Nietzsche Wizard Pro, although Armitech often do promotion sales with substantial discounts and there are permanent promo codes you can look for at the Budget Light Forum or Flashlight subreddit. Now about the shipping. They've opened US-based warehouse some 6 months ago, but when I tried to calculate the shipment for lights in stock, only some of them were available for delivery from US. The majority of lights require $30 shipping from China. You heard me right, $30 shipping. It's hard to say anything bad about this flashlight. It's the best tinted light I ever owned. The quality is above every expectation I had, and users generally satisfied with Wizard series lights. You can check user reviews and comments on the internet. Now about the Armitech company, so I don't sound like a sales rep. There is a lot of room for improvement. I often see topics and comments of users struggling with the warranty. And I can understand this frustration. When Canadian company asks you to ship the product to China for 30 euros from your own pocket, wait for months and follow up with multiple emails. Sometimes it's truly comical to watch a cry for help from customers trying to get some answers from the company and the very next post is from Armitech with a crossword puzzle. 
So, the promise of 10 years of no hassle warranty with a 100% guarantee of return in exchange without any fuss seems really optimistic to say the least. And the recent flop is just infuriating. The company stole a picture from the Instagram user, photoshopped a copyright watermark and used the photo as a promo material. And it seems like they do it all the time. Sometimes they mention the author in the description and then remove it in a couple of days. When I saw the post, all the material for the review was already filmed. The script was ready and at that moment I wanted to trash it all and forget about it. But then I thought, no, I don't want to punish the engineers that made such a great light. I want to expose the scumbags in charge of that Instagram account. Because there are multiple reports from users whose content was straight up stolen by them, lots of infuriated comments and frustrated community members swearing never to buy the lights again. Was it worth it? Then, almost a month after the story, when, quote, all the guilty were punished because they value their customers and will no longer tolerate cases like this one. They post Armitech Wizard Pro Nietzsche become better with a photo that they took, cut around the watermark and posted without mentioning the author, who is a moderator of the subreddit. That's really bold, guys, but it won't do any good. By the way, the post is about them fixing the low voltage protection. The communication problem is very deep. I've never seen them responding. The problem with LVP was never addressed. They vaguely mentioned that they fixed it in a reply under the Instagram post. That's not the way you communicate the critical problem. Maybe being a Canadian company is not the best for you right now. You can be sued in Canada like outside China, you know? Just stop, the gig is up. All you have in common with Canada is a business registration and PO box. Fix your communications and don't pretend like you're listening to feedback. Extend your innovations above the emitter swap level. Do something with this outdated charger. Start making some sense with your messages or just hire some help. Feel free to comment, subscribe or send me other lights for review if you don't afraid of an honest and biased opinion.